coming up, safe roads versus safe cars, inspired by a damn fine question from you. Well, you know, maybe not specifically you, but certainly not from some toilet paper hoarder out there in the general public. How risky exactly is driving? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands of their brand new cars. Hit me up on the website. Where is the step-off point between a safe road and a safe car? Will there be a point in the future where a car is so safe that the road is simply an afterthought? I only ask this because you never really talk about how shit Australian roads are compared to some Euro roads. Excellent question, Jeremiah. So let us talk about death. There hasn't been enough of that lately, God knows. Always uplifting in the midst of a zombie apocalypse and on the tip of everyone's tongue in any case. In the immortal words of my brother from a different mother, Phil Collins, I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh, Lord. So, to put this in perspective, it's going to take me a couple of minutes to get to roads and cars, okay? Because it's kind of pointless addressing this without getting a handle on what's really likely to kill you and what's not in the context of living modern life in an allegedly developed country such as Australia. People are actually very funny about death. You've probably noticed, especially the inevitability of their own. So unwilling to acknowledge that it's kind of out there awaiting all of us ultimately. Some people, perhaps you, are just terrified of death, flat out petrified at the prospect And yet, well, I can't speak for you, obviously, but my own consciousness dissolves routinely every night. It's perverse. I lose all sense of myself. One moment, you know, I'm lying there, fully here, staring at the ceiling, counting pole-dancing Ming moles, (laughs) and the next I'm just gone. I don't know where. One subjectively ceases to exist every night of one's life, typically, for about six or eight hours. It's very, very strange. I'd suggest that death is actually kind of like that, only substantially longer and no waking up, if you know what's good for you. I'd put it to you that we are emphatically whacked as a society when it comes to death and risk and countermeasures and things of that nature. As I read this to you down this fine teleprompter and hope like hell that you can't tell that I am reading, the zombie apocalypse, which you might have noticed, is going on all over. And here in Schittsville, it's claimed the lives of 21 people, sadly. 21. And hey, exponential growth. We're right down the bottom of the curve and flattening the curve. I get all of that. It could be thousands. Ultimately, nobody knows. We've got to hope for the best and plan for the worst and wash our hands and stay home if we can and generally be socially responsible. And I'm on board with all of that. But at this stage, it's 21 people. And this is enough, apparently, together with the salient risk and uncertainty for senior elected dickheads to impose a World War II-style deficit upon all of us, to bring the economy essentially to its knees, to close many public places and impose quasi-house arrest on the population. And I'm not making any comment about the effectiveness of these countermeasures and whether or not they're worthwhile. They're just facts, okay? Here in New South Shitsville, home of the Opera House and the Shitsville Harbour Bridge, entertainingly enough, our fuckwit Premier, well, she's elected to keep schools open while at the same time deploying the cops forcibly to eject any person, even sitting alone quietly, from a beach or a public park, which seems somewhat inconsistent to me. It leads me to the conclusion that these kinds of people have no fucking plan whatsoever. I think you'd agree, okay, that if the zombie apocalypse ultimately claims 29,000 proud shit's villain lives, and I hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, most people would be stunned and appalled 
and 2020 will certainly go down as a bleak year indeed. And yet, for perspective on this, this number of people dies every year routinely from smoking and diabetes here in Shitsville every year, 29,000, okay? That's a big crowd, I think you'd agree. That's 24,000 ballpark from smoking, that's according to the Cancer Council, and about 5,000 more people from diabetes. It's actually 4,656, according to the Bureau of Statistics for 2018. Pretty clearly, smoking is wearing the yellow jersey on this, and diabetes is on the charts with a bullet, the seventh biggest killer of all of us. I'm just putting it out there that tobacco remains a legal product here in Shitsville, and the sugar content of average food is hardly on the decline, at least not that I can see, nor is it regulated. 29,000 deaths every year from these two things like frigging clockwork and they're optional, okay? People choose, effectively, to die in this way, or their choices kill them, let's put it like that. It's unlikely that the zombie apocalypse will be as bad as one year's worth of routine smoking and diabetes. In contrast, 1,145 Schittsvillians died on the road in 2018. That's certainly a lot of dead people. I mean, if they all got together for a meeting or something, you'd need a big room. But it's only 4% of the smoking and diabetes problem. In other words, smoking and diabetes kills 25 times more of us than road trauma. It kind of goes without saying that if you took truly epic fuckwit conduct out of the driving equation with Harry Potter's wand or something equally powerful and magical, road death would actually be a hell of a lot lower because driving is intrinsically safe. And it's really only in the red zone, danger-wise, when fuckwits go out of control, right? In fact, you are roughly three times more likely to die from falling off something like a friggin' ladder. I'm not making this up. Accidental falls are number 16 on death's greatest hits for Shitsville in 2018. According to Ausstats, 2,952 people die in this way, okay? Accidentally falling. And I'd put it to you that there's a wad of legislation which would stop a bullet, were you to print it out, covering all aspects of driving. We have endless police patrolling our roads. We've got speed cameras and red light cameras and even mobile phone cameras today. You know, but you can walk into Bunnings just for comparison and you can buy yourself a six metre extension ladder and you may erect it anywhere you want at home with absolutely no training and no oversight, no regulations. Go figure. And while you're up there on that ladder with no training, I mean... How exactly are you supposed to know how far back from the wall to stick the feet of the ladder with no training? Pro tip on this, okay? Whatever the height of the ladder is, if it's four metres high, you've got to stick it one metre out at the base. It's one for every four, okay? So four metres high, one metre out at the base, Goldilocks. And that balances the risk of kind of (laughs) falling over backwards and the feet slipping out from under you if you get the angle too steep or too shallow because they're the two risks, right? Anyway, while you're up there in that environment painting the friggin' gutter or something... This environment that you are in, up there painting the gutter, it's roughly three times more likely to kill you than driving, okay? Statistically. Not if you do it properly, but statistically. You could take heart, though, because this is not the most dangerous thing that you can do in ambient society. According to Ausstat, statistically, so-called intentional self-harm is even more likely to take you out and thus more popular with the Grim Reaper than the friggin' ladder. It's number 14 on the charts for 2018. And yet, the highway patrol, so prolific, yeah? The ladder police and the self-harm squad and the sugar patrol, not so visible, I think you'd agree. Perversely, I suppose that if you ask most people what was more dangerous, okay, climbing a ladder or living at the bottom of a pit of endlessly bleak thoughts or driving a friggin' car, 
they would actually get the order of relative risk spectacularly wrong on all three counts. So many more resources devoted to regulation and enforcement on the road. Driving is actually very safe, and no activity is wholly benign, obviously, but you can easily make driving ridiculously dangerous simply by being a fuckwit. We drive more than 200 billion kilometres annually in Schittsville, and 1,100 people die. Not to trivialise any of their deaths or the tragedy that surrounds them, but it's statistically irrelevant, okay, road death. Which brings me to the answer in perspective, okay? It's not just cars and roads. Driving is a three-part system. It's drivers and cars and roads. The safest road transport system is when you get the safest drivers in the safest cars and you put them on the safest roads. And I'd suggest that cars are way in front of drivers and roads, certainly in things like crashworthiness. Generally, the automotive industry is well in front on those three pillars. You know, drivers, cars and roads. The cars are great, the drivers and the roads, not so much. We've got a somewhat unique problem with the roads here in Australia, right? We've got a big continent, it's roughly the same, t- the same ties and the same size as Retardistan. But there's only about one-tenth of the population ballpark. So we don't have much cash per capita, per kilometre, to spend on the road, which is why the roads take geological time to upgrade, seemingly. There's no question that safer roads save lives, okay? They just do. So when Jeremiah asked me, will there ever be some time in the future when cars are so safe that uh, the road itself is kind of an afterthought? I've got to say, yeah. Never. That's never going to happen. See, there's a limit to how much energy you can absorb in a controlled way so that the loads imposed upon you by a crash remain survivable. And presently, that limit exists in that travelling speed ballpark of 64 to 80 k's an hour with an approximately front-on impact, okay? Pretty much if you're in the safest car on earth at 80 k's an hour and you hit a massive unyielding object like a big tree and that stops the car, you're going to die. Hashtag physics. There's no clever hack for this. We can't subvert this process much more than we already have. So if you're going sideways at the same time and you have that same sort of crash into an unyielding object, it's probably 45, 50 k's an hour and it's all over. And this, of course, is why we need safe roads. Smart civil engineering does three things, okay? First up, what it does is it lets you see further down the road and you therefore get more time to react to whatever. And that's a real advantage, okay, in the crash avoidance department. And secondly, all of this engineering removes all of the hard, unyielding objects so that there's really nothing substantial to hit. And third, if there's an object that can't be removed, okay, like the walls that hold up a tunnel or a grade-separated interchange or something, these things are designed in such a way so that direct impacts that stop the vehicle are not possible or else, in the case of things like big steel staunchions holding up signs and things of that nature, they're protected with barriers so that you can't hit them front on. Head-on crashes are prevented too by virtue of the similar sort of protection and or physical separation of opposing flows of traffic. So if you're in this situation, you happen to be doing 110 or something when you lose control, the time duration of that crash is extended and the loads on you become survivable. You just can't achieve that at highway speeds with the car alone. Unfortunately, despite the relative safety of driving generally, It's still down to you and me and everyone else out there as individuals not to be a fuckwit. And I think you'd agree that this continues to be a real challenge for many Australians, no matter what their station in life. You know, this is like a personal obligation and not at all unlike all of the demands being placed on us right now to behave socially responsibly in the context of the apocalypse. The same kind of social responsibility obligations pertain every time you get your hands on the steering wheel. Get out of bed, don't be a fuckwit, repeat. But some people... They're just not wired for that, tragically enough, and a great deal of road trauma is attributable to drivers whom I would categorise as recidivist fuckwits. I'm talking about the scumbag 
who's been disqualified from driving for 12 years or something. But he drives anyway, and he's pissed and in an unregistered car, and he's friggin' speeding with two unrestrained kids in the back on the way home from a fucking methadone clinic. A complete ticker of every known fuckwit box, in other words. And this is the stereotype asshole who is pumping up road trauma. Coincidentally, this is exactly the same category of person the cops and the court system fail spectacularly to remove permanently from driving among us. And here I must say the courts are far worse than the cops. How many second chances do these fuckwits need? You know, if somebody's been disqualified from driving for three years and then you increase it to five and then you increase it to 10 and then 15 and then 20 and they continue to friggin' drive, I'd suggest that ever-increasing periods of disqualification are an ineffective countermeasure to the fundamental problem. These people need to go inside and they really never do that until they kill somebody. And I'd suggest that when that happens, shutting the door after the horse has already bolted. The regulators, however, they do seem very good at pinging you or me for being, I don't know, six Ks over the limit or something, or presently for you sitting in a park on your own, minding your own business, you know, and to me these things are trivial. But as for getting these actual scumbags off the road, right, they remain emphatically incompetent. And unfortunately, I have to say, that's an example of your dwindling tax dollars at work.